that's test one, two. All right, good evening and welcome to the Frankfurt Link Live for this Thursday, January 27, 2022. I'm Michael Monks, reporting live from the Link NKY headquarters in downtown Covington. Today we'll be talking about what's going on in Frankfurt and how it impacts all of us here in Northern Kentucky specifically. We're joined today by Link NKY politics and government reporter, Mark Payne, who joins us from the One NKY Alliance House in Frankfurt, they are our sponsor for this broadcast. Mark Payne, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Michael. We wanna let you all know that Mark Payne is covering the Kentucky General Assembly throughout the 2022 legislative session. He'll be there embedded, living there in Frankfurt throughout this 60 day session, reporting on what's going on specifically as it pertains to those of us in Northern Kentucky. And you can read his reporting at rcnky.com. We also have the great pleasure of being joined today by two Northern Kentucky lawmakers, Democratic State Representative Rachel Roberts of Newport. Representative Roberts, thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, I'm happy to be here. And Republican State Representative from Erlanger, Adam Koenig. Representative Koenig, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me, everybody. And also joining us for analysis today is Northern Kentucky University Associate Professor of Political Science and Bellevue City Councilman, Dr. Ryan Salzman, who apparently took cues from my closet today and putting on a sweater and a collared shirt. Dr. Salzman, thank you so much for being with us. There's a, there's a plight of being in your early 40s, right? Michael, you understand that. And I we're, we're bound to sweaters and collared shirts. It's just, it's a thing. But thank you for having me. I'm always excited to be here. I don't know what you're talking about. I just had a birthday. And as you can see from these balloons behind me, I'm merely 24 years old. <laughs> so sorry to hear about your rapid age progression. We're going to get to some analysis from Dr. Salzman momentarily. We'll hear from our lawmakers about how the session has been going and what the redistricting situation looks like for them specifically. For them. Specifically, first, let's turn to Mark Payne, Lincoln KY politics and government reporter in Frankfurt. Mark, you've been there every day. Let's start with today. What did you see going on in Frankfurt today? Yeah, so there was a lot going on in Frankfurt today. Um, one of the big things was is uh, a contingent of NKU leaders, including the president, they came down um, to present to the House Subcommittee on Higher Education. Um, as part of this presentation, um, they are looking to potentially get some more uh, performance funds. So the way that universities are funded is they kind of get base funds and then depending on meeting performance goals, they get uh, additional funding. And there is quite a bit more money in the house budget for higher education this time around. And so potentially NKU could get more money. So typically there's about 12.7 million in this performance fund every year as part of this potential biennial budget there's going to be 50 million more on top of that. Um, so that would appear in 2023, 2024. Um, and so NKU came down to present um, as part of that. Governor Bashir also uh, announced today that as part of their $200 million that they're giving for tornado victims in Western Kentucky, they bought uh, 200 uh, kind of like temporary camping house, camper houses. Um, that they're going to start sending down to Mayfield and Dawson Springs. They have one of those campers 
literally parked between the Capitol and the annex and they were kind of showcasing that off. Um, and so those are just two of the big things that happened today. Obviously there's a lot more and we'll get into it. Um, and then and in general this week, uh, you know, with the filing deadline and we're going to talk about redistricting yeah, tonight. For the campaigns, right? Because this was the, the new legislative filing deadline and really the filing deadline for local races that were that may require a primary in May, depending on the, the size of the field. It was moved while the redistricting maps were considered in the General Assembly. So that happened this week. You were there at the Kentucky Secretary of State's office where legislative candidates and judicial candidates file for office. And sometimes that can be exciting. Was it exciting for you this week to watch? It was interesting. It was a little bit of a party, <laughs> to be honest with you. And apparently, usually it's a big deal. Usually there's a line. Um, but with the candidate uh, filing deadline being pushed back, uh, there wasn't it wasn't as crazy this time. But a, a lot of lawmakers and journalists gathered down by the secretary's doors and, you know, uh, and pay close attention to it. So it's very interesting and it made clear what the Northern Kentucky races are gonna look like, especially now that all these you know, local districts have been redrawn and, and you know we have Adam and Rachel on tonight and, and both of them are gonna face challengers this year and Adam's gonna face them in the primary and, and potentially the election. So it's shaping up and it's gonna be interesting. I'll tell you what's interesting, Mark, is that you're already on a first name basis with these lawmakers. I don't understand I used to call them by, by their honorific, but uh, good for you for uh, talking. <laughs> We will talk about that with, with both of you now. Uh, you're both in districts that will have elections in November, apparently. Neither of you will be unopposed for your offices, and you'll also be running in adjusted boundaries this time around. Representative Roberts is a Democrat from Newport. I know that the Democratic Party gave a lot of attention to your district and the way that it is drawn for this 2022 campaign. Talk to us a bit about your feelings when you first saw the map that was drawn by members of the Republican caucus in the House of Representatives. Well, first I'll just say that Mark is correct to call us by our first names. Um, if we are on the House floor, we refer to as the lady or the gentleman. If you're writing to us, you should refer to us as the honorable. In the hallways of the annex, we call each other rep, but on Zoom, it's just first names. That's how it works. Um, <laughs> well, the lady, and, and if you wouldn't mind, if you just call me the gentleman from Kenton. For the <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try to remember that. Um, you know, there's been a lot said about redistricting. I, I'm not happy with maps overall. I think that they are, you know, what what people complain about about politics. They do smack of partisan gerrymandering. When it comes to District 67, there's a lot of talk about the, the visual look of District 67 on the map because it was a U, right? And it, um, you know, it might not have made a lot of sense visually, but community-wise, it made a lot of sense. But what they've done now is they've taken um, a district that they said was oddly shaped because it snaked along a river and they've just snaked it down a different river. Um, you know, if it was, if someone had asked me how I would have redone the, drawn the district, I would have drawn it differently. Now the, you know, the population changes up there absolutely meant that the district had to change. Um, I think there's a pretty big argument for making it more compact. Um, you know, district 67 is what it is. I'm not, um, I, some of the districts were drawn in a much, uh, more detrimental way for the citizens and for the people who are holding those seats currently. I don't necessarily think that's what happened in District 67, but I do think there's a pretty good argument to be made for it having, having been kept more compact. I'll just tell you on a personal note, like I love Silver Grove in Melbourne. Like Silver Grove fish fry, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. It's my favorite fish fry. I'm sad, you know? My gallbladder takes a hit every year because of that. I'm gonna miss that community greatly. But I will tell you that in District 67, I hope the biggest winners are the people of Fort Thomas and Cold Spring who have been reaching out to me throughout my terms anyway, um, because they know I'm responsive and I've been helping them. So I look forward to helping them more should these maps stand. Let's turn now to the gentleman from Kenton, District 69, Representative Adam Koenig, a Republican who has served that district for a long time. Your district has changed. You've been through this a couple of times. You've been in the House for a while, so you've seen your district change somewhat. Yours uh, traditionally follows the Dixie Highway uh, from Kenton County into Boone County. Not a whole lot of change to your district this time around. So talk to us a bit about the process. You are a member of the Republican Party, which controlled the map making this time around. Are you pleased with the way it turned out? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, this is uh, the second time I've been through redistricting, and this will be the third different district I've run in, uh, having first run in 2006 in uh, a phenomenally gerrymandered district. 
that they drew to try to get rid of my predecessor, um, John David Reinhardt, who lived in Claryville in Campbell County. And they drew a big U all the way up and made the heart, heart of the district Erlanger and Ellesmere. He managed to survive that um, over the years, but I had parts of uh, back then, Kenton, Boone, and Campbell County. I had two precincts in Boone, two precincts in Campbell, and my district went into four different state Senate districts. So uh, that was phenomenally gerrymandered. I didn't know where Grand Slick was when I first ran. Uh, I, the first thing I did, I swear to God, after I went to Frankfurt and filed, the next day I drove to Grand Slick and Claryville so I knew where the heck it was I was talking about. Um, and then obviously uh, 10 years ago, um, actually Democrats drew districts uh, that were so unconstitutional, we sued one day, we got a hearing before the Supreme Court the next week, and literally, I think it was six hours after the arguments were finished, the Supreme Court unanimously threw out those maps. So we ran over under old maps for another year, and here we, and then we drew different maps. Mine compacted a great deal, but you can go up and down uh, up to 5%. And uh, the way things worked back then when Democrats drew it, myself, uh, then the 63rd District, which I think was John Drought or Alicia Webb Edgington, I forget which one, Sal Santoro, Adia Wishner then, Joe Fisher, they crammed plus 4.99% of people into all of our districts and what is now Rachel and Buddies, but was Dennis Keene and Arnold Simpsons were minus 4.99%. So they could maximize, and they did that in Louisville, they did that in Lexington, they did that across the state where they could in order to maximize their ability to hold on to um, the house. And obviously Rachel didn't have anything to do with that. And I'm not throwing any blame her way, uh, but I mean, that's just the way things work. You don't see that happening in these maps. Um, with, as far as my district, um, it, stay, it had to compact some because again, I was plus 4.99% and then we added more people to it. So it's gotten a little smaller. I picked up, I think I've lost six precincts and picked up five, but four of those five are precincts I had when I first ran in 2006. So I'm familiar with them and, um, you know, I'm, I don't really have too many complaints. Have you been to Grant's Lick since? Uh, only on my way to play Pendleton County Country Club where my brother is the uh, superintendent. So <laughs> a big shout out to our viewers in Grant's Lick. Or I God bless them. Actually, and if you are watching this broadcast of the Frankfurt Link Live, Leave us a comment with your questions or your perspective about what's going on in Frankfurt and how it may impact Northern Kentucky. And we will address those questions to our panel today, which of course includes State Representative Adam Koenig, the Republican from Erlanger, and also Democratic State Representative Rachel Roberts of Newport, and Link NKY politics and government reporter Mark Payne, who is in Frankfurt as well. We're also joined by NKU Associate Professor of Political Science, Dr. Ryan Salzman. You may also recognize him from the Bellevue City Council. And Dr. Salzman, we heard Representative Koenig there talk about the gerrymandering that took place in 20, after the 2010 census when Democrats were still in charge in Frankfurt and drew up some maps that were uh, rejected by the state Supreme Court. Now we are seeing allegations from Democrats that the Republicans have engaged in partisan gerrymandering in their map making. This isn't uncommon, not in Kentucky, not in any state that the political party in charge wants to stay in charge. And so some maneuvering may take place during the cartography in order to ensure that. Is there a way that some states have found that might work better to eliminate this widespread suspicion every decade? Yeah, we're seeing big trends right now in creating bipartisan or nonpartisan redistricting commissions, uh, quite a few out in the Western United States, but they've certainly proliferated over the last 10 years or so. And in fact, our neighbor to the north, Ohio, uh, created a kind of commission. And what's really interesting is that even though in Ohio, that commission uh, was, uh, you know, it was a bipartisan commission. So you knew what the party affiliations were of the participants on that commission, five Republicans and two Democrats. So even though that skewed uh, you know, strongly Republican, which is what their legislature skews uh, right now, Nonetheless, the creation of that commission 
also came with changes to their state constitution that then the courts, the Ohio Supreme Court, were able to lean on very strongly when assessing. And I think that that's something in Kentucky that, you know, those uh, criteria aren't quite as clear and so can enable some of that partisan gerrymandering. And in Ohio, the news has been over the last two weeks or so or less that, uh, that those maps have been tossed out. The House map has been tossed out and also their congressional map has been tossed out because of a requirement that the maps create districts that on their face at least favor the political party to an extent that when we look at the totals, they get somewhere in the range of what the voter distribution is in a presidential election. And that was really long, but essentially in Ohio is 54, 46 in the last presidential election. And so the courts say it probably needs to be somewhere around there. It's not gonna be 54, 46 when it's all said and done, but the maps that had been proposed <clears throat> more in the two to one range, that 67, 68% range, which there were justifications given for that, but the court said, no, you can't do that. So these bipartisan and nonpartisan redistricting commissions are proving to be pretty successful at circumventing partisan gerrymandering, particularly if they come with good criteria that then the courts can use to go with that. So there's certainly a solution to the problem that doesn't necessarily require getting rid of state control, more local control of districting in that way. So there's there's options out there. Well, Ryan, let me ask you this, and I'll also bring our state representatives in to talk about this as well. Over the course of the conversation about redistricting in Kentucky, we hear a lot of references to Democratic districts and Republican districts. And these aren't districts that by nature belong to any political party. We do still have elections, regardless of the boundaries in which they take place. Is there something anti-democratic uh, not in the partisan sense, but but in the governance sense, about this idea that certain districts belong to one party or the other. Is this a message to the political parties in Kentucky that they should be more competitive, that there should be a better way to get your message to voters so that there is true consideration for the candidates? Policy making, public policy is very nuanced. Our two representatives that have joined us know that. And uh, kind of dumbing it down, for lack of a better word, to blue and red just loses that nuance. I mean, for instance, you will have within districts certain industries that are very favored. And those industries may presumably be more blue or more red, you know, maybe heavy public sector or, you know, something like natural resource extraction. And so even somebody who you would think had these other reasons for voting D or R might actually put their industry first. And so that's just, you know, a really simple example of how you know, political party isn't the be all and end all for these. There are lots of reasons, if nothing else, we're neighbors with each other that we could, um, you know, potentially choose a representative that advocates for those. Now, I don't know that the system is such that that's really possible as uh, across parties anymore, but I do know of Democrats who are very good at what they do professionally, or there's something about their district. And I know the Republicans will look to them for cues for shaping policy because they know that they have um, those contacts there and vice versa. I'm sure when the Democrats were involved, reaching out to people in those districts, but you don't see that anymore. And that that is a disservice kind of talking about the larger democratic climate that we don't appreciate that nuance and it's just lost on this, is it a D or is it an R? Whereas every district has some Ds and some R's in it. You're watching the Frankfurt Link live here on the River City News Facebook page, brought to you by the 1NKY Alliance. We're joined by Dr. Ryan Salzman from Northern Kentucky University, also Mark Payne, the Lincoln KY politics and government reporter here at Lincoln KY. He is in Frankfurt throughout the duration of the 2022 Kentucky General Assembly legislative session. We're also joined by two state lawmakers from here in Northern Kentucky, Democratic State Representative Rachel Roberts of Newport and Republican State Representative Adam Koenig of Erlinger. I'm your host, Michael Monks, reporting live from downtown Covington, the Link NKY World Headquarters. So Representative Roberts, I want to turn to you on that now because we did hear a lot of references to Democratic districts and Republican districts. And I, I want to challenge you as a Democrat, because you and Representative Buddy Wheatley of Covington are the only Democratic members of the Legislative Caucus, and it, it would appear that you're a dying breed across the state. So is there something that Democrats here need to do better so that 
certain districts are not just considered thrown away to Republicans. Michael, you're breaking up there a little, but I was fortunate enough to hear the dying breed part. So I'll start with that. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, let me just go back to what Dr. Salzman was saying. Anything that erodes the public trust in the process, anything that makes a voter feel like their vote is less important than someone else's vote, or that, you know, even worse, that it just doesn't count because of where they live, you know, it continues to lead to people's lack of faith in our electoral process and in their in their leaders, you know, and um, you know, Adam and I know each other well enough to know that you know, we both have other skill sets. We both could be doing things in, in the public sector, but we've chosen to be public servants. It's important to both of us to hold these seats and to represent the voices of the 45,000 roughly people that we represent. Um, and that's great. And I, and I have said this in other places and I'll say it again. I think the people of Northern Kentucky are uniquely lucky in Kentucky in that we have what I think is the most bipartisan collaborative caucus of all the caucuses in Kentucky. Now, there are only two Democrats in the Northern Kentucky caucus, but I don't feel like our voices are not heard within our caucus. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate to bills getting heard on the floor. And the people of my district expect me to pass bills for them. And as a Democrat in a hyper minority, that's nearly impossible for us to do. So, um, Again, I didn't quite fully hear your question, but I will say on the dying brief part where there are few of us, we are still able to be effective and get things done for North Kentucky. Well, I'm gonna unplug that mic. We're still figuring out our, our technical, you can see by the, the fanciness of our graphics that we are a startup here and, and we're just trying to figure out our, our technical challenges. But uh, so I'll just talk into the computer mic just in case it was the mic that was breaking up and you weren't hearing me. So hopefully this, this sounds better for our guests and our viewers on Facebook today. And Representative Koenig, I know that uh, you recall a time in Northern Kentucky where Democrats were in charge at the county level. They held more seats certainly in, in the state legislature. And what was it that started the shift. I'm not necessarily asking you to give advice to your democratic rivals on how to start their <laughs> building efforts, but was there some sort of cataclysmic shift that took place in, in one fell swoop or, or was there some strategic plan to boost Republicans in state legislative districts in Northern Kentucky? There was a strategic plan, uh, I think from the stories I've heard, I'm not quite that old, uh, from the uh, late seventies and the eighties um, to try to get um, Republicans elected and Clyde Middleton, judge executive uh, in Kenton County, Ken Harper, uh, state representative in suburban Kenton County, um, Barry Caldwell before that were all kind of, and, and your last week's guest, Rick Robinson was uh, uh, instrumental in the Barry Caldwell election, I think in like 79. So um, it's a, uh, they were kind of the forerunners. Uh, fast forward to um, 1998, and I was one of the beneficiaries of this when uh, I got elected Kenton County Commissioner at the ripe old age of 27. And that was the year that Republicans took over the Kenton County Fiscal Court for the very first time ever, all four of us, with Dick Murgatroyd at the top and Gary Moore in Boone County. They swept everything. Campbell County, you got uh, Judge Pendry, and I think he got one commissioner at the time. Uh, and something about 1998, obviously, Northern Kentucky has always been a relatively conservative area, a lot of conservative Democrats. Uh, heck, my, everybody in my family was a Democrat, and they don't think much different now than they did 30 years ago, but they were all registered Democrat because that's where the elections were held. And um, I think 1998, uh, Bill Clinton scandal, uh, just happened to kind of help flip everybody over to vote Republican for the first time. And like I said, I was in a position to take advantage of it. And here we are now in Northern Kentucky being um, you know, overwhelmingly Republican and, and the state house, um, you know, when I first got here in 2007, we had 36 members. And that summer we had two Republicans switch to Democrats. So we were down to 34 members literally 15 years ago, and now we have 75 under democratically drawn maps. And, and the point of that is to say, you know, I don't think it's gonna switch anytime soon, but one day it will switch. And, um, you know, you can't rest on your laurels and you can't let power go to your head or 
that that uh, switch will will speed up. Frankly, if you don't pay attention to the people and what they want, that you'll you'll uh, you'll die as a party and you'll end up back in the in the twenties again. And when that day comes, perhaps Representative Koenig, you'll be campaigning in Grant's Lick again. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> let's go nice to, call uh, back. Let's go to uh, Mark Payne. He is our LinkedIn KY politics and government reporter in Frankfurt covering the 2022 Kentucky General Assembly. And, and just a quick note, our coverage is brought to you today by the One in KY Alliance. Mark is reporting from the One in KY Alliance house in Frankfurt. I'm Michael Monks, your host. I know that our display name said Mark Collier. I should be so lucky to be Mark Collier. I'm using his computer. He's here with me helping me produce this program today. I know you all know him well as well. Mark, what was the response uh, now that the filing deadline is coming gone? We know that, that there are still uh, legal challenges out there uh, against the current maps. Are you hearing anything that this could all be disrupted somehow? I haven't heard anything besides the lawsuit that was filed last week by the Kentucky Democratic Party. And in Northern Kentucky, the two big claims um, that they have is that it's partisan gerrymandering, and then the other one is excessive splitting. And I know there were some excessive splits in Northern Kentucky, particularly Campbell County, which, you know, has uh, Rachel's uh, Rep. Roberts district. Um, but that's the big thing right now. I haven't heard too much with that lawsuit. They just filed in Franklin County, Frankfurt. Um, so, but besides that, I haven't heard too much else. Yeah. Well, we'll note that the, the maps are so strange, certainly on the Senate side, that I believe I'm sitting in Senator Chris McDaniel's district, but right across the street is Senator Will Schroeder's district, or at least on the other side of, of Madison Avenue. So it is interesting what has happened in downtown Covington as these maps have been revealed. But let's talk about some legislation. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of what's taking place on the floor of the General Assembly. And Senate Bill 88 passed the Senate today. This is something that enables legislation for a constitutional amendment before voters in the fall. Kentucky voters will be considering a constitutional amendment to allow the state legislature to call itself into special session. Representative Koenig, can you explain to us the motivation behind this constitutional amendment that's proposed? Yeah, I think there's two motivations. One, obviously, uh, what happened in 2020 with the pandemic, uh, basically kind of ramping up as we were leaving town, uh, nine months of being uh, out of Frankfurt and uh, the governor issuing executive orders and debate whether they were good or bad. Um, you know, you can find tweets from me going back, you know, many, many years saying government by executive order is bad. I don't care if it's uh, Bashir and Bevin or Obama and Trump. Um, that's what the legislative branch is for. And so um, I think it's it's uh, a motivation that way is, is to, when we have actual emergencies like that, we can bring ourselves back into session to do uh, some work that we feel like needs to be done if, if the governor does not agree to bring us back. And, you know, since the Republicans have, have taken over uh, the House and therefore both ends of, of uh, the Capitol on the third floor, House and Senate, no matter who the governor has been, whether it's been Bevin or Bashir, we continue to try to claw back what should be legislative prerogative. Um, People don't want a full-time legislature, I think, uh, by and large. But, you know, when we're here 30, 30 days one year and 60 days the other, and either way, we're gone by April. Um, that leaves a lot of time for other things to happen. And so, um, you know, one person's version of emergency might be different from the legislature. So uh, we will uh, hopefully pass that, leave it up to the voters to see if they agree that this is good policy or not. I'm, I'm going to turn to Dr. Salton in just a moment so we can talk more broadly about the separation of powers in state government. But first, I want to give Representative Roberts the opportunity to share any Democratic perspective in, in case it's different than what Representative Koenig shared. Well, I'll share my personal perspective. Um, and, and I say this all the time. These seats are really hard to hold. They're really hard for normal people to hold. And I think that we need more normal working folk in the General Assembly. You know, we have one active educator in the General Assembly. She may be the only person we have in the General Assembly who is part of an affiliation or a, or a union. Um, I don't think we have any active nurses in the General Assembly. You know, we have a lot of attorneys. We have a lot of retired people. 
I think what we should be doing is making these seats either easier for normal working folks to hold so that we are more representative of the people, you know, the normal people that we are serving and representing, or we should be a full-time legislature. But what keeps happening is that we keep making it so that you know, we have this 30 or 60 day session that we know we need to be here. We have interim, but then if you were considering this, but you could be called back in at any moment. I mean, our special session this past year, we were, we found out on Saturday that we were due back on Tuesday over a holiday weekend. So if you have child care needs or elder care needs or a job, it makes it really, really challenging for normal people to hold these seats. Um, I'll also say just more broadly that you know, we've talked a lot about, we, when we talk about gerrymandering and the maps and so on, we talk about what happened way back when. Well, one of the things that happened way back when is that we had an imbalance in our co-equal branches of government. You know, you can look back to the 70s and say that the executive power had way too much influence over the legislative body. And I worry that we are starting to tip the scale the other way now, that we are trying to have too much influence in the executive or that we're micromanaging them in a way um, that isn't healthy either. That, that's a concern that I have, but Dr. Salzman may have more insight there. Let's go to Dr. Ryan Salzman, Associate Professor of Political Science at Northern Kentucky University and a member of the Bellevue City Council. I believe the only city in Northern Kentucky that now has robots working as servers. A sign of things to come, Dr. Salzman. Yeah, it's like it's the future when you cross over, you know. Uh, so well, come to Bellevue and see for yourself. Uh, well, let's talk because uh, Kentucky is not the only state that dealt with the pandemic, right? It's, it's a, a global pandemic. And so we learned a lot about executive authority and responding to this unprecedented crisis and a lot of criticism at Governor Bashir about the way he responded. Also, a, a lot of accolades. I mean, people were certainly supportive of a lot of his measures as well. What have we learned about executive authority, co-equal branches of government in Kentucky over these past two very challenging years? Well, the, the whole point of our system of government in Kentucky and in the United States of America is to establish friction, essentially, between people, you know, some of the, those classic documents that we like to look at, talk about, you know, pow only power can check power. Like that's the whole idea. So we created these different branches. And certainly if the, um, if the pandemic had resolved itself in a few months, I don't doubt that this policy would still be moving forward. And I would probably have a very different take. But what do you do when a crisis enters its second year? What do you do when a crisis enters its third year? And so let's let's hope we don't get there. But I think the third year begins on March 14th or something like that. So so, um, you know, that is a very different scenario. Um, the ability to act quickly is what the executive branch is there for to deal with crises as they arise. But to Representative Koenig's point, what happens when they become more protracted and the inability of a legislative body, Congress doesn't have this problem because it's a full time legislature. Uh, but the, and even at the local level, you know, we convene monthly <clears throat> in Bellevue and are able to make decisions. But the state government is unique in that way and the ability to call themselves in. So like everything, if there's nuance, if there's details, you know, after a certain amount of time, if a crisis is declared, somebody could call themselves in, you know, OK, you know, I could probably see the wisdom in something like that. But unfortunately, this constitutional amendment is not going to be about checks and balances and separation of power. It's going to be Democrat versus Republican. And that's what it's going to come down to. And that's not necessarily a good reason to make a decision like this. You know, I don't like who's in one, <clears throat> one power in one or in the other. And that's clearly what's going to end up happening. So back to nuance. And um, so to that end, you know, I, I'll be interested to see what the campaigns around this constitutional amendment are and um, and what the details are when it ends up uh, being said and done. Likewise, we'll get the legal experts to be able to weigh in. Um, if you change the rules, you change the rules. So the, the role of legal experts is different, but I'm definitely curious to see <clears throat> their thoughts on this as well. I think it was the great political philosopher, Cersei Lannister, who said, power is power. I'm sorry, I have never been able to update my references since Game of Thrones went off the air. I've never found another television show and that, that's all I have to this very day. I'm working on it, I'm trying to find something. But in the meantime, you are watching the Frankfurt Link live here on Facebook. It's brought to you by the One NKY Alliance. I'm Michael Monks. We're joined, by, joined today by, by two state lawmakers from Northern Kentucky, Democrat Rachel Roberts of Newport and Republican Adam Koenig of Friendship City, Erlanger. We also have Mark Payne, 
We have him embedded in Frankfurt as Lincoln KY politics and government reporter throughout the duration of the 2022 Kentucky General Assembly. He's living down there and reporting every day for us. And also Dr. Ryan Salzman, Associate Professor of Political Science at the Northern Kentucky University. And he's also a Bellevue City Councilman. We thank all of you for watching, leave your comments and your questions, and we will address some of your questions to our lawmakers, our other panelists, while we continue this program. Again, we're gonna talk a little bit about some legislation and coming up. I know a lot of you, particularly during Christmas when a lot of packages were coming, are concerned about porch pirates, people who come through the neighborhoods and just grab something off your post, uh, your porch. I see them posted on Facebook all the time. Some legislation moved today that hopes to tighten some of the penalties for that. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, Representative Koenig, I know you're a big sports betting guy. Uh, can you give us an update on why this is so important to you and where any legislation in Kentucky stands currently? Sure. Well, um, actually, I probably will hardly ever bet on on sports. But uh, I think it's important that we legalize it and allow people the opportunity to do so. Um, it is now legal in 33 states. Uh, it is operational in 31 states and the District of Columbia. Uh, we are surrounded by legal states on all sides except for a small border with Missouri. So, uh, and look, it's, it, the American Gaming Association estimates that $2 billion a year is, legal, Ill, is wagered illegally in Kentucky every year. Uh, it's important that we, A, regulate it to make sure those people have protections uh, from their offshore accounts that they're wagering on or uh, with their bookies, and uh, which they currently have no protections, and that we generate some of the revenue for our general purposes. Uh, and lastly, you know, um, there's a lot of people like to talk about freedom. There's a lot of people that, uh, you know, in other parts of the state are campaigning on freedom. And well, freedom is getting government out of the way so people can do what they wanna do as they see fit. And they come up here and vote now. Uh, this is a freedom issue. This is a liberty issue for all those that like to talk about that. Um, this is government stopping people from doing things. So uh, I think it, it's, it's important. It's something that we all know that it goes on. I talk to the, the rural people up here, and if they don't know a bookie in their area, they know who to call to find a bookie. So it's not like it's not happening. Where is the, I, I guess, the discrepancy here from lawmakers in Kentucky on why Kentucky does not have this legalized yet? Because one of our signature industries is horse racing. And that is something we very openly bet on. So where is the moral threshold there where we're so enthusiastic about this iconic Kentucky-centric sport that involves betting, but the other sports are off limits in this respect? Well, you say that, but even last year with our historical horse racing machines, which is an extension of our parimutuel wagering uh, with um, horse racing, it, it was a very difficult lift and um, it was it was bipartisan difficult unfortunately uh, it was bipartisan support but it was also bipartisan difficult and um, so it's not not from Rachel but um, anyway the and I, and I, I flustered I you and made you mute yes, yourself you Adam I may yeah. I, I have plenty of support from uh, some Republicans and lots of Democrats for my sports betting bill. That is a bipartisan uh, uh, plus, but um, electorally speaking, it's easier for many rural members to be a no vote on both uh, expanded gaming and expanded alcohol use. Simple as that. Well, let's go to Representative Roberts who is based in Newport. And I imagine that a lot of these bookies that Adam Koenig referenced are probably based in Newport, if you know the history <laughs> of them. <laughs> I mean, there is a bar in Newport where I've heard rumor that they were still running numbers out of it just a couple of years ago. Just, um, I mean, <laughs> Representative Koenig and I are on the same side on this. Um, and, and I hope we'll have a chance to talk about cannabis down the line because I feel like Representative Koenig just sold just Absolutely. sold every reason I think I'm we should legalize cannabis in the state of Kentucky. 
Every week that we do this program, we will be talking about cannabis until I'm hosting it smoking a blunt. In fact, let's <laughs> talk about it now, Representative Roberts. Who's bogarting the cannabis legislation this session? Well, let me go back to something uh, Representative Adam just mentioned a minute ago. I forgot we're on Zoom there, but this is formal for a second. Um, that HHR vote from last year is really telling because to his point, there is a, a, a fairly large contingent of legislators who are not going to vote for anything they deem sin, sin and gaming and weed are sin in their mind. So that's something he and I are both going to have to work through if we want our legislation to move forward or we're going to have to find bipartisan support. Obviously, I'm going to have to find a lot of bipartisan support because I'm not passing a full you know, cannabis legalization bill with 25 members. Um, but let's talk about the bill. So I, I wrote down some notes here. Um, you said 31 states have legalized gaming. Well, 36 states have some form of legalized cannabis, 18 states full recreational. Um, we should absolutely be regulating it for protection for our citizens. Let's make no mistake. Weed is being sold in Kentucky. It's being grown in Kentucky. It's being consumed in Kentucky. It's just not being regulated or taxed. Uh, we should tax it for, for revenue generation, absolutely, and freedom and liberty. Do you agree with that, Representative Koenig? Uh, here's my, where I'm at. Um, I voted, I'll look at Ryan, he's interested. Um, <laughs> I voted against medicinal marijuana, and here's why. I don't think we have an FDA for a reason, and boy, it has the last two years uh, indicated why we have an FDA why we have an FDA process. And um, I know that medicinal marijuana helps people. I have friends and supporters who, um, uh, especially with, with kids with um, Dravet syndrome, uh, and, and they tell me this is the only thing that helps them. Uh, and, and, and I don't take that lightly. But how do I say, well, you can do this, uh, but you shouldn't be allowed to take ivermectin. Explain to me the difference there. That's why we have an FDA. That's why we go through that. So I say that to say this, uh, I have a difficult time reconciling everything I've just said about gaming and not being for, frankly, recreational. If we're going to do it, let's just go full hog because if we pass medicinal, and we will one day, it's gonna happen. Um, the very next day, those supporters will be pushing for medicinal. Let's just cut to the chase if we're gonna do it and just go there. I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm going to vote for it, but that I would be open to. Um, but that's why I voted against medicinal, but I would probably be open to uh, recreational because that's where we don't tax medicine. If it's medicine and it's medicinal, that it shouldn't be a revenue source except for the uh, income taxes that people who work for the dispensaries pay. Uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna tax it and we're gonna make revenue, let's just go recreational and be done with it. We heard State Senator Damon Thayer, the uh, majority leader there in the state Senate and also represents part of Kenton County currently, uh, though he's based out of Scott County. Uh, he said on, on one of the KET shows recently that, that he recognizes that probably a majority of his own constituents would support a legalization of marijuana and he still wouldn't support it. And it, what is the challenge, Representative Koenig, with getting this on the floor, you all can rush, you all being Republicans in the General Assembly can pretty much put through whatever you want right now. You might face a veto, but then you can override it. Why won't you give us cannabis, man? Well, look, it passed the House. The year I voted against it, I don't remember if that was 2019 or 2020, um, and it didn't go anywhere in the Senate. Uh, and honestly, I think the, the sponsor has told me privately, and he can speak for himself, Jason Nemus, um, that there's no sense in putting people through another vote and another discussion uh, if the Senate's not going to pass it. So uh, after that, it's up to leadership as to whether or not uh, they want to run it. We have a rule that that is held up my sports wagering bill uh, that you need half or a majority of the majority. So we have 75 members, so we need 38 members out of our caucus to uh, before something before it moves. And I, I mean, I think he's got the 38 votes for that. So if it doesn't move, it's probably not uh, a house issue. And I'm not trying to throw the senators mm -hmm. under the bus. I'm just telling you the way it works. And that's why, that's why I didn't pass last time. So it's probably not a surprise. 
Dr. Salzman, what are we seeing across the nation? We already know that a lot of states, uh, more than half, have some form of legal access to cannabis, medicinally or recreationally, including several states that we can drive to if we so choose, and then bring it back to the state where there is no revenue coming uh, back into the state coffers. Is this a winning political issue for the lawmakers that push it? Well, it seems like they don't think that it's winning political issue. And I think it gets back to what Representative Roberts said that, you know, that's, um, it, they're, again, we're losing the nuance in public policy making, just like freedom can be a banner, likewise, sin can also be an umbrella that things fall under. Um, and then once you've uh, seeded that mantle, that position, it forever becomes an attack line against you. And speaking about those attack lines, you're not worried about what's going to happen on election day. It's the months leading up to election day that are the problem. Do you want somebody to dominate, you know, dominate your campaign, making you constantly respond, constantly have to justify your actions? Um, you know, again, adding that nuance and just kind of making you look bad when the whole point is to get reelected. It, it gets much, much more difficult, even if you are highly favored in that end. There's also, I think, on the Republican side in particular, um, this concern about being labeled as a rhino. So there's this infighting that occurs. And then when you are, you know, you're not good enough, you're not strong enough. That's another one of those umbrella ideas that become very problematic. Now, I think that the minute that it passes, the opposition probably, you know, fizzles like a day old Coke. It's just, there's, there's nothing left to it because uh, to your point, the majority of people that are behind it um, will, you know, they're not going to make any issues for you uh, once that moment has passed. But the concern that you're going to, you know, motivate somebody in a primary campaign or motivate somebody in a general election campaign to really undermine you, I think, I think it's real. And the research says that, you know, we're single-minded seekers of re-election. And so you run everything through this lens of, will this get me reelected? And we do it subconsciously, but it happens nonetheless. And this is one of those that's very, very difficult. And I think Representative Koenig has seen this, both, both of the representatives that are with us, despite advocating for wildly different issues, have the same problem in front of them. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a lesson in electoral politics, but it's be, really being laid bare right now. And Representative Roberts, My very quick. On this, I right want to ask a question. Uh, yeah, Michael, if you don't mind, I want to ask a question to the well, panel. Um, so, under the federal 2018 um, hemp bill, you can go to any CBD supplier and get a like a Delta eight strain of hemp, and mm -hmm. that's psychoactive in Kentucky. So, what's the difference, you know, between being able to legally do something like that now and being able to buy marijuana in the future. Well, I'm going to tell you a secret, and this this can be you know breaking news here on on Link. In late 2019, that's right. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I spoke to Garen Colvin at um, uh, Saint Elizabeth yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. said to him, "Hey, um, we have all these CBD stores running all over the place. There's no regulation." There's no protection. No one knows what's in there. That could be what, you know, illegal, whatever. Um, I would love the hospital association KMA to help me come up with a system by which we can um, figure out how to regulate it instead of having, you know, the uh, old, old uh, rental movie place on Dixie Highway by where I live, stay in business by selling CBD oil or what they say is CBD oil, because we don't know what it is. And he said, yes, I agree with that. We should work on that. We're going to work on that. And then a pandemic hit a couple months later, and uh, they've got more important things to work on at St. Elizabeth than this right now. But I think it's a completely valid question, Mark. And I think it's something that, I mean, I, I'm all the uh, marijuana bills, whether it's medicinal or uh, recreational, have it highly regulated. Alcohol is highly regulated. Gambling is highly regulated. Why is CBD ru running around open and not regulated? It doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, so maybe one day I'll get around to that after I, you know, take away police powers from constables, uh, passports betting, and do a few other things. So 
No, that family video is not still open, is it, Adam? No, it's turned. At, ironically enough, it's it's turned into a, a facility where you uh, uh, go to get uh, uh, mental health services. So, very interesting. Uh, yeah, because all the old blockbusters around here are something else now. They're you know. Uh, yeah, it was a family video. Family, family video managed to hang in there the longest. So good for them. Okay, so Representative Roberts, very quickly before we move on to a couple of other topics as we start to wind down this program, do you see any vote coming either in committee or on the floor for any cannabis related legislation this session? I wish I could say yes. Um, you know, I, I don't think we're there yet, unfortunately. The medical bill may have some movement this year. I filed an amendment to it uh, when my my issues with the medical bill this year is it doesn't have any behavioral health considerations mm -hmm. whatsoever. And I think the, the main group that's really been pushing this for the longest on the medical side are the veterans and they've been asking for PTSD. So I filed an amendment to PTSD on that bill. Um, but I think we need to approach this as a, as a comprehensive plan, everything from hemp all the way through adult use so that we can do exactly what Representative Koenig just said. All of this should be regulated. It shouldn't just be regulated. We should be making a new Kentucky proud product. You know, there are other states I have heard tell of that you can go and you know effectively do a weed flight. You know, you know everything about where that came from. You know where it was grown. You know if it's um, you know organic. You know whether what its properties are. Those kinds of things. There is a marketplace for this that other states are capitalizing on, and we are losing out on, much like we are with sports wagering. You know, this is we can't pretend like this isn't happening. It's happening here. We are paying for all of the detriments to whatever people think is, is sinful in the state, but we aren't reaping any of the financial rewards that could help us to regulate it. And then in the case of um, the cannabis bill that I'm putting forward, a, a portion of the revenues that we generate will for perpetuity be put towards substance use treatment programs for some of the other ills that we have in our society. All right, again, you are watching the Frankfurt Link live here on Facebook. I'm your host, Michael Monks, joined today by two Northern Kentucky lawmakers, Democrat State Representative Rachel Roberts of Newport and Republican State Representative Adam Koenig of Erlanger. We're also joined by Link NKY politics and government reporter Mark Bain, who is embedded in Frankfurt to cover the legislature throughout its session, and also Northern Kentucky University Associate Professor of Political Science, Dr. Ryan Salzman. Mark Payne, I wanna bring you back in, and I may be putting you on the spot, I'm not sure if you caught this committee meeting today, but some legislation moved that caught my eye because constantly on the Facebook feed, you see people posting, hey, do you know this person? He came on my porch and he took my UPS, my Amazon, my FedEx delivery, please help me get it back. Well, State Senator David Yates, a Democrat from Louisville is, is pushing a piece of legislation, Senate Bill 88, that moved out of committee today unanimously, and it would make stealing a package off a porch a Class D felony. Uh, did you hear anything about that today? I did not attend that committee meeting, but I did hear about it, and it's really interesting. That is something that's always on Facebook, and especially if you live in Northern Kentucky, there's all these different Facebook groups around town, for example, and where Ryan lives, the Bellevue Alliance, and around the holidays, people always post about it. I know that local police departments give you the option where you can have your packages delivered to the police station during the holidays, but it's it's definitely always a problem. And, you know, if that remedy is it, great. Um, but I would be interested to see if it does. Yeah, for sure. It is true. If you are on Facebook and as journalists in this community, we have to join all those groups to keep an eye on what's going on. If you're in the Bellevue Alliance, you're hearing a lot about how slow the McDonald's is. If you're in the Ludlow group, you're hearing a lot about how dirty the family dollar is. But in addition to those consistent themes, you are also learning about porch pirates. And what this legislation does is it makes it a class key felony. And Senator Yates says that this brings it up to the same penalty for stealing mail. Back when this law was originally enacted uh, 40 some years ago, he says, we did not consider the type of commerce that we have today. There wasn't the Amazon, the FedEx, and all the delivery courier services. So they're treated different under the law today. And that would change should Senate Bill 23, excuse me, I said Senate Bill 88 earlier, but Senate Bill 23, which would make it a class D felony. Uh, Representatives Koenig, Representative Roberts, uh, Koenig first, uh, this seems like something everyone can get on board with. Let's get these porch pirates and throw them in jail. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's theft and you can't go up there on somebody's property and steal anything else. Why is that okay? Um, so, and I would like to and I would like to point out two things. One, that is a Democrat bill that's moving in the Senate. Uh, and so uh, I think that's important to note. And 
you know, it, it is interesting because we hear a lot from my friends on the Democrat side that, you know, we, we shouldn't be increasing penalties. We shouldn't be putting people in jail. And, but we pass a bill like this, so that, that's a little unique. Uh, but uh, in the end, uh, I mean, I think it's a good bill. I think it'll fly through the House. And it's needed, and I'm glad Senator Yates came up with it. Can we get you on the record, Representative Roberts? Will you stand against porch pirates? <laughs> um, I actually have the bill pulled up on my screen here, and it's it's one of those simple bills. It just adds, uh, I think, five words to the existing statute, and it does just list common carrier or delivery service. So it's already a felony um, to steal from the United States Post Service, right? And we understand that. Um, I, Michael, you hit us up with two Senate bills today. And I'll remind everyone that Representative Koenig and I are in the House. So these are bills that we haven't had as much experience with as our Senate counterparts have. Um, I'll just tell you truly off the cuff because I have I wasn't in the hearing today. I haven't heard it. Um, delivery service is a little concerning to me. I don't necessarily think that someone should face a felony if they steal my Uber Eats poor dietary decision. So I'll need to look at this one a little bit more closely. <laughs> All right, that's fair. Okay, before we run, Mark Payne, let me bring you back in. I know you've been keeping an eye on social media, including something called TikTok. And uh, as Ryan mentioned earlier, I'm now in the lower foothills of middle age, so I don't get all of the social media apps, but apparently some of the state lawmakers do. What are you watching? Yes, I caught on to this this week, and Rachel maybe could answer this question because I know that she is one of the representatives that I saw on TikTok. But that seems to be a new way that uh, representatives are commuting or uh, communicating on um, social media. I know uh, McGarvey's on there from Louisville, a couple other folks, but it's been an entertaining way to learn about some legislation. It's actually the way that I learned about um, Representative Roberts uh, House Resolution 50 today. So it is working, um, but I'm curious. Uh, uh, Rep. Roberts, how do you, um, what is this new movement for political TikTok? I think it's, you know, we want to meet voters where they are. You know, Northern Kentucky University is in my district and a lot of people of that age are into TikTok. Um, I like it because I can do these very concise, you know, three minute roundups of the day's activities. And let's be honest, you know, Representative Koenig and I live this all day, every day, and, and you all cover it. Mark, I know you're living it just as much as we are right now. But most people aren't paying attention to state government and state government affects people's daily life so much more so often than even the federal government does. So I love it as just a way to share with people, you know, pull back the curtain and say, this is what it looks like to be a state representative. This is the legislation that's moving through. This is how you can be a better advocate or ally if that's what you want to do. Um, you know, I have throughout my entire life always had like blogs. I, I got my start in journalism. It's just storytelling is something that I'm really passionate about. And I think the more in my life, the more I have shared my experience with people, the better it has served me. And I hope people find other benefits. From it. Representative Koenig, uh, I understand after a couple of bourbons, you're quite the dancer. Could you be doing some of those choreographed moves on TikTok? Probably more karaoke than, than dancing, but, but thanks for uh, throwing me out there. And I'm not on TikTok. I'm not on Instagram. I probably should be. Adam, I'll come to your office after this and we can do a TikTok together for everyone's benefit. All right. I would like to see that. I would like to see that. And Dr. Salzman, I'll give you the last word on this. How important is it that today's elected officials adapt with whatever's popping up on social media? Single-minded seekers of re-election. <clears throat> what can I tell you? <laughs> Good. It's Dr. Ryan Salzman, Associate Professor a political science at Northern Kentucky University, also a member of the Bellevue City Council. We've also been joined today by state representatives, Rachel Roberts, Democrat of Newport, and Adam Koenig, Republican of Erlanger, and our Link NKY politics and government reporter, Mark Payne, who is embedded in Frankfurt throughout the duration of the Kentucky General Assembly. And uh, I wanna let you know that the one in KY Alliance, the house in Frankfurt from which Mark is reporting today is our sponsor for the Frankfurt Link Live. Thank you so much for watching. We hope you'll tune in again next week, Thursday night at seven. We'll have another lineup of guests talking about what's going on in Frankfurt and how it impacts us here in Northern Kentucky. I'm Michael Munch reporting live from the Link KY headquarters in downtown Covington, which I think is still in Senate District 23. We'll talk again next week. Thanks everybody for being with us.